stand and join us as we begin our worship in song. God, to think that you come and live within us, we thank you for that. We're here to celebrate the fact that you are our God and we are your people. So join us today as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, go ahead and take a seat. And uh, I don't have a lot of announcements. They're in your bulletin. If you look at your bulletin and see what uh, is scheduled for um, the week where we've got our prayer groups going and celebrate recovery and youth groups. So those are our usual things. I do have this paper that was shared with me and it's an Advent giving uh, calendar. And so like the first day of Advent, which is December 1st, you take one box of cereal and put it in a bigger box in your house. In the second day, you put a jar of peanut butter, a new jar of peanut butter, not the old one, a new one, and so on. And by the end of um, the Advent season, you have a box of food that you could bring to the church, and then we can have it in uh, one of our little storage areas. And when we have families that come in that have need, we'd be able to hand that box off. So if you'd like one of these, see me after service, and I'll give you one. But I thought it was a great idea to just celebrate what God's doing in our life. So right now, um, I really don't have any other announcements. Maria? Let me put my cup of coffee. My cup of coffee's right here, and I, I have two cups. I don't know whose I've got, so excuse me. <laughs> okay. So I have some helpers, if you guys are ready. We are starting Advent, which I always say I'm the last Protestant that ever knew what Advent was. Advent literally means waiting for the coming of Jesus. And so uh, for anyone who this is new to, Advent has become just a favorite of mine over the last several years. It's really changed Christmas for me. And so we have four candles. First week we light one candle, the second week we light two, then three, then four. Christmas Eve we light the Christ candle. It's just a visual way of counting down and um, that we're waiting, that we're waiting for the birth of Jesus. So I have some helpers. If you guys want to start coming down, and we're going to read um, the beginning of the Christmas story. Luke chapter 2. Oh, and Elijah, yes, if you want to go ahead and light the candle. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. 
And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David. You can stand here and let them... Um, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. So we have up front, we have the nativity and little puppets. And I just encourage the kids, come touch and play with them just as a way to just be reminding ourselves what is Christmas about. And this is the beginning. We're talking about Mary and Joseph and the birth of baby Jesus. Also, the different candles each have sim uh, symbolism. The first candle is the candle of hope. It says, prayer, here's a candle for the prayer of the candle of hope. Lord, you are the light of the world. Heavenly Father, we long for your plan of rescue and redemption to be realized. Give us hearts that see your beauty and wait in hope for you to make all things good and new again. May your light and love shine brightly in our hearts, spreading hope and peace to those around us. Did someone say I'm on? <laughs> I'm on now. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, kids, for, for helping with, the, with that. And we are going to celebrate Advent through the month of December. Actually, we're starting here at the end of November. We're also going to spend time reading through the, uh, the birth of Christ from Luke's Gospel. And so today we'll begin doing that. And so I'm going to read to you, beginning in Luke chapter 1, and I'm going to read the first 25 verses. The bulletin says verses 5 through 25, but I decided to change that spur of the moment because we should also read the first four verses. They remind us that Luke wrote with care, I was listening this week to a brief podcast, and the person who was presenting was arguing that Jesus was not a historical person, that Jesus never lived. I thought, wow, what a statement. I mean, I'm familiar with people who say Jesus wasn't the Son of God, Jesus was elevated by the church to be something he wasn't, but to actually argue that there was no historical figure with the name of Jesus. This is, this is uh, you know, so beyond what even liberals do with Jesus. And so as you think about that, let me just read these first four verses, because Luke makes a point here of reminding us of his great care with which he investigated all of these things, including the birth of Christ. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile the narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught." And so Paul or Luke wrote to this man, Theophilus, but he's also writing to all of us that we might have certainty concerning the things we have been taught. And so our first reading today is the foretelling of the birth of John the Baptist. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, 
and both were advanced in years. And while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord to burn incense. This would have been a one time in his life experience. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, don't you think? And fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Good name. <laughs> John the Baptist. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. All right, well, we're going to spend just a few moments in prayer today. And my prayer list isn't as long this Sunday as, as some Sundays. It's good to have David back in church today, and I guess your family has overcome COVID. And there's some buildings in our midst and in Aguilera. Um, so we know you've had some COVID in your house, so we are still praying for Tiana as she is home and she's pregnant and just praying for the health of the pregnancy. And then also, I think, just in a general sense, to just be in prayer for our nation. There's just so much happening in our nation. It was just a week ago now, the situation in Wisconsin with the red SUV and a Christmas parade and someone just running people over. And so there's just so much in our nation where we need the intervention of God. And then just asking God's blessing upon our worship service. So let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for this day. And we thank you for this season that we are entering into, this Advent season, the season of waiting, this season of coming, the coming of Christ into the world. And I know, Lord, from my own experience, and I'm sure that I speak for most in the room today, how easy it is for us to become distracted, actually to live lives of distraction, how hard it is for us to be focused on the right things all throughout the year. But certainly also during the Advent season, during the Christmas season, it is so easy for us to miss the, the beauty of this season. And so I pray that even beginning today, uh, that you would speak to our hearts, to our minds, slow us down, help us to contemplate, help us to meditate, that the Christmas season this year will be beautiful and meaningful and sweet to us. We thank you every Sunday for sending Christ into the world. We thank you especially this Sunday. 
We thank you because we know that we are sinners. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and we know that that describes us. But we also know that we are saints through Christ, if indeed we are in Christ. And so we thank you for giving us a Redeemer. Uh, we do thank you for the people of our congregation. I do thank you that the Bashirs are recovering uh, the buildings as well. Uh, we do lift up Tiana to you today as, as we know that she is with child and uh, Lord and is, it has, has had some issues. And so we just pray for her as this is an early pregnancy, um, but we pray that you will be at work in her womb, that you will protect this child, uh, that you will watch over her. And Lord God, we also do today, uh, we pray for our nation we don't really even know how to pray for our nation. Words fail us. Uh, but we know that our nation needs so much from you. Uh, a need for a spiritual renewal, a spiritual awakening. The need is so great. And Lord, whenever I think of our nation and the needs of our nation, in my mind, I always think of the church. To pray for the church, to pray that the gospel will be proclaimed that there will be faithful ministers, faithful preachers, uh, that the church will be strong, that the church will be consistent. And not just, of course, this church, but the church across this land. We pray, Lord, that the gospel will be proclaimed during this Christmas season and that you will use the church to influence the culture. As we've gathered here today for corporate worship, we again ask you to minister to us. Send your spirit to teach us, to guide us. Help us to worship you today through, through song and through prayer and through the word preached. And so we just commit this time to you. We thank you for it, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's stand together and say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yes. 
my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Lord, let that be our prayer. As we open our hearts to you and your word, Lord God, I'd ask that the Holy Spirit would empower us, help us to keep our focus upon you. Lord, we thank you for an opportunity to come and hear the word preached. That word inspires us, and we thank you for that. Lord, we just ask that you bless Pastor John as he delivers that word, and Lord, bless each of us as we receive it, that it be life-changing. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you're seated, the kids, third grade and under, um, if you'll go out through the double doors with Miss Carol and Miss Kathy, they have children's church. I don't know, Scott, I might have missed it. Did, did we comment on the tree and just how lovely the sanctuary looks this morning? No, go All right, it does look nice, doesn't it? And... Uh, I want to thank those of you who came yesterday and helped decorate our building. All right, we are going to, not today, well, let me tell you what's going to be happening. Today, we're going to stay in the book of Exodus. Next Sunday, my family will not be here, and so James Campbell will be preaching, and we're going to be in Mexico, so... We'll be thinking about you while we're on the beach, okay? And we're not going to drink the water. Good advice, right, Bill? Yeah. Then when I come back, we'll be really into the Advent season, and I'm going to spend a couple of Sundays, I think three Sundays actually, with some Christmas themes and two of those Sundays will be spent, I think, in Matthew's Gospel. And then the, the final one will be spent in Luke's Gospel. And then we will, Lord willing, return to our study in Exodus. And so it actually works out well. Today's passage is in many ways a transitional passage. So we're kind of coming to a logical stopping point at the end of chapter 4. And then chapter 5 will, will be a new section. And so we'll start that new section um, after the Christmas season. So today we are in Exodus chapter 4. And the verses that we're going to consider together are verses 18 through 31. So basically the second half of Exodus chapter 4. And, and I got to tell you, this is a really interesting passage of Scripture uh, it's, some of it is a bit bizarre. I had one of you last Sunday hit me up, up after church. They said, I'm reading ahead. I want to know what you're going to do with this paragraph. There's a bizarre paragraph in this section of Exodus that we'll uh, try to deal with as best we can. But uh, by way of getting started, I want to tell you a story now, if you've been around the church for a while, this is a story that you've heard before. That's one of the pitfalls of a long-term pastorate, is you do start to recycle stories. I mean, it's just part of the reality. If you're newer to the church, well, good for you, because this will be all fresh material. So the story involves my, my grandfather on my mother's side, and his name was Ed. And I've mentioned Ed a lot over the years, Grandpa Ed. He was six foot five and very powerful built man and in a lot of ways a man's man. He spent his life pulling wrenches. It made him very strong. He had hands, so long fingers and, and incredibly muscular fingers. I mean, I, I've got these wimpy hands. I remember Sunny Wright years and years ago, we were having a prayer time here at the church and we were all holding hands and afterwards she said, she looked at me, she said, oh, your hands are so soft. <laughs> You know, some things you just don't forget. I mean, just the insults you just can't forget. 
That's right, Sonny, I sit writing sermons a lot. I'm not pulling wrenches, and so my fingers aren't that muscular, and I don't have a lot of calluses. So my, my, un- my grandpa Ed was a man's man, very powerfully built. He had an uncle, and that man's name, his uncle's name, was Ed. And so these, these two people had the same name, Ed and Ed. And so there was, I would call him Grandpa Ed, and then there was Uncle Ed. Of course, my, uh, to Uncle Ed, my Grandpa Ed was not his grandpa. You, you're, you're tracking with me, right? Now, these two grew up virtually together, living just a few houses apart, same neighborhood. And Uncle Ed was five years older than the other Ed, my grandpa. And so they grew up in a relationship that in a lot of ways was more like older brother, younger brother. My grandfather had four sisters. And so, you know, Uncle Ed was the closest thing he had to a brother. And it was an older brother. But growing up, Ed insisted that the other Ed refer to him as Uncle Ed, even though they were only five years apart. Now, my grandfather went off to World War II, served in the Pacific Theater, came home, and there was a conversation. I don't know all the details of this. Uncle Ed became a barber. They had a lot of conversations. There's other stories about Uncle Ed the barber and another, another occasion. But on this occasion, these two men were talking, there were others around, and Uncle Ed said to Ed, you know, I still could take you. And my Ed, future Grandpa Ed, said, not a chance. And so they got into it. And I guess it got pretty violent. Not, not like blood or guts, but it was a full-on wrestling match. And eventually, the younger Ed, my grandfather, pinned Ed. Now, Uncle Ed was not a Christian, and he had a full range of special words that could be used on these kinds of occasions. He got angry, and so he started cursing, but he was just held down until finally he was exhausted and he said, let me up. And my grandfather said, I'll let you up when you say uncle. (laughs) Okay, isn't that a great story? You know, cry uncle. And so I guess Uncle Ed had to say uncle to his nephew And that's just the story as it came down to me. Now, I'm reminded of that story this morning because in a very real sense, in this passage today, we have Moses crying uncle, don't we? I mean, he's made all of these excuses. He's he's argued with God. They've gone back and forth. God has been very patient with Moses. Finally, we realize that God's patience is exhausted It says that there was anger towards Moses. Moses has come to a point of saying, yes, I'm going to obey. I'm going to Egypt. I'm not happy about it, but I've cried uncle. And so that's the passage before us as we transition from the experience on Mount Sinai, the burning bush, And then the next section here in chapter 5, which is Moses with the elders of Israel in Egypt. And so this is a bridge section explaining how Moses got to one location to the other location. And so let's look together, beginning verses 18, 19, and 20. Moses announces his departure to his father-in-law. Moses went back to Jethro his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. 
And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And so the opening verse here is basically a statement of Moses being polite, Moses respecting his father-in-law. He's, after 40 years of serving this man, of working for this man, he's married to this man's daughter. He's, Jethro has grandsons, and Moses is uprooting all of them after 40 years and taking them back to Egypt. And so he goes to his father-in-law and announces his departure. He does not need his permission to leave, but he certainly desires Jethro's blessing. And Jethro gives his blessing to him. It is interesting that Moses does not share in great detail what he's been ordered to do, does he? What he says specifically is, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. That's a true statement, but it is not an exhaustive statement of what God has called Moses to do in terms of serving as the redeemer of an entire nation and confronting Pharaoh. Maybe Moses just didn't want to get into it with Jethro at this point in time. But he goes to his father-in-law and he receives permission to return to Egypt. And then we have in verse 19, and it's an interesting statement where God says to Moses, we don't know how God speaks to Moses in this moment, but he says to him, go back to Egypt for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. And I find that an interesting statement because in the ancient world, when the administration changed. And of course, they didn't have elections back then, so Pharaoh didn't lose office. He couldn't be voted out of office. He had to pass away, or I suppose a king could be assassinated. Dying led to transition. But with a transition in the ancient world, there was a change of status for those who were under some threat of death. And so, by God announcing here, go back to Egypt, for Pharaoh has died, is in essence is what he is saying. He's saying, you're no longer a fugitive. You can go back to Egypt, and you don't have that status of fugitive from justice over your head. No one's going to arrest you. No one's going to prosecute you. And we actually have a fairly close parallel within the Bible itself in the Old Testament scriptures. If you remember uh, the description within the Old Testament of the city of refuge. Remember that concept of the city of refuge? So if you are guilty of what we would probably call manslaughter, it's not intentional homicide, but something happened and someone died. And there was the avenger who's seeking your life, usually a family member. And so there were these various cities of refuge that were established where the manslayer could flee to this city of refuge. And the point was that this was a place where he would experience refuge. He would be safe from the one pursuing him and pursuing his life. Do you remember this from the Old Testament? Yes? Now, the text tells us that the man must stay in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. Because, you see, that represented a change of administration. Now, with the change of administration came a change of status. So the manslayer is now no longer liable to be put to death because his status has changed. Does that make sense? It might seem foreign to us, but this is how the ancient world processed some of these issues of justice. And so this is the statement here, go back to Egypt for all the men who are seeking your life are dead, has the ring of truth about it. Yes, this indeed is how the ancients thought and how they functioned. 
So we read, Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride in a donkey, and he went back to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And I made mention to this last Sunday, this statement, the staff of God. This is, of course, the shepherd's crook. It is merely a piece of wood. It is Moses' staff. It has been his companion for decades. And yet this staff is identified here as the staff of God. It is the staff that God will use to perform mighty miracles in Egypt. And so Moses sets forth. The next section, verses 21, 22, and 23, Moses is called to confront Pharaoh. Let me read those verses to you. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. Some translations have the word worship there. The senses serve and worship. It's both of those ideas. But it's a change of administration. The children of Israel, they've been serving Pharaoh. But now they're called to serve God. If you refuse to let them go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Well, there's a lot in those verses. First of all, I would point out to you, looking primarily at verse 21, it seems to me that God here is giving in advance. He's proclaiming in advance. He's telling in advance the work of Moses in Egypt. In other words, none of this is made up at the moment. None of this is God responding to something unexpected by Pharaoh. Now I've got to modify my plan in some way. I didn't expect that. I didn't account for this response. No, Moses, uh, God knows in advance, the Lord knows in advance precisely what is going to happen to Moses in Egypt. As so when he says here, do all the miracles that I put into your power to do, we think, of course, initially of Moses casting down the staff and turning it into a serpent, or Moses taking the clean hand and putting it into his cloak and pulling it back leprous, or Moses taking clean water from the Nile and pouring it out and it becoming blood. But I think beyond that, we should think of all of the miracles that Moses will perform in Egypt, including the ten plagues, including the parting of the Red Sea. God is saying in advance to him, you will do all these things. And God is saying in advance to Moses that Pharaoh will not repent. And God is saying in advance to Moses, I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. And so you see in this that God really is the author, isn't he? That God really is the authority, isn't he? You see, we're to, we're to recognize in all of this the sovereignty of God in all that is about to take place. And as readers, we're to find great comfort in that because at the end of the day, the sovereignty of God is one of the most comforting doctrines in the Bible. To know that God rules over our days, that God is in control of the details of our lives. Now, let me make a few more observations. We're going to obviously have to deal with, wrestle with, think hard about these many statements in the Exodus narrative. This, I believe, is the first of them. I believe it is. I guess I should go back and read to make sure of that. But this statement, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. What does that mean? What can we say about this? 
And much of what we're going to say is going to be said in coming weeks. This is a major theological theme in the Exodus narrative. But let me make a couple of observations this morning. Number one, and this is an obvious observation, but it's important to state it. Let me remind you that Pharaoh was not innocent. Was he? We are not dealing here with an innocent man. Pharaoh is not innocent, and God did not create unbelief in Pharaoh's heart. God will harden Pharaoh's heart, but he will do so in such a way that God does not create unbelief in Pharaoh's heart. No, rather, Pharaoh is an unrepentant person. Pharaoh has a hard heart. Pharaoh's heart is ablaze in hostility towards God. And I think, as we'll explore in greater detail in weeks to come, what God will do with Pharaoh is simply give him over to his heart. He will simply abandon Pharaoh to his unbelief. He will release Pharaoh. And in the process of releasing this man, of giving him over, his heart will grow increasingly recalcitrant. Dead and hard. Dead in the sense of dead in sin. But let's face it, you know what? A dead heart is also a diabolically alive heart. Isn't it? Dead in sin but also alive in its hostility against God. That's one observation. A second observation, the reason for the hardening of Pharaoh's heart is to prolong the struggle. To prolong the struggle in order that the glory, the majesty, and the power of God will be more fully displayed. Now that's actually taught directly in the text. So if you look with me at Exodus chapter 14, we're introducing today this idea of God hardening Pharaoh's heart. Chapter 14 is the conclusion of all of this. And in Exodus chapter 14 verse 15, we're really reading sort of a summary statement. What has this all been about? The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? The context here is getting across the Red Sea. It's a crisis moment. Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. What a mighty miracle that must have been. Don't you think? I don't know. I sometimes visualize this. I think of Moses and the children of Israel walking through this, the wall of water on each side. And I wonder if they looked into that ocean and they could see some fish swimming in there. It's just an awesome thought to contemplate. He divides the sea. The people of Israel go through on dry ground. Look at verse 17. And I will harden the heart of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. So God prolongs this struggle. And he actually is at work hardening Pharaoh's heart so that God can demonstrate his power and his glory but we recognize that this is ultimately for a good purpose. It's not only the, the, the delivering of his people and the showing of his power, but notice what this power shown accomplishes. That the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. We know that when the children of Israel left Egypt, a great throng of people left with them. And they were not all the literal descendants of Abraham. There were individuals who witnessed this event and saw the glory of God and they became worshipers of the true God as a result of seeing the glory of God. Now that says to me what each of us needs today 
and tomorrow and the next day and every day, we desperately need to see the glory of God. You need to see the glory of God, so you need to be reading Scripture. You need to be asking God to show you something of His majesty as you read the Scriptures. Because as you see the glory of God, you're changed in that gaze. All of a sudden, God becomes glorious and majestic, wondrous. A third observation, and this is an interesting one to me. How do you think Moses would have assessed these words? I mean, after all the struggle at the burning bush, finally Moses has cried uncle. Moses is now ready to go, and almost the first thing he hears is, by the way, Moses, when you get to Egypt, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart so he's not going to listen to you and he's not going to let the people of Israel go. I mean, Moses could initially think, God's against my mission. But I rather suspect that upon further reflection, Moses had a very different response indeed. I want to suggest to you that Moses would have found these words to be very encouraging because they serve to remind him that Pharaoh's heart is entirely in the hands of an all-sovereign God. Consider Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Now that's a statement taken from an agricultural perspective, but in irrigation of a farmer's field. And so you can visualize the farmer as he's opening the gate in order to change the channel of the water so that it no longer waters this field, but now it will water the field across the way. And so the verse is saying that God's power is such that it is simple, it is as simple for God to turn the heart of the king as it is for the farmer to open the gate or to close the gate to water this field and not that field. In your sermon notes, I think I'm going to read this to you. It's just a great quote from a great commentary that's been helping me in my study of Exodus. Alec Matir is the author of this commentary. Let me read these words to you. The Bible believes in a God who is really and truly God. What does that mean? Well, he gives examples. Not a sparrow falls to the ground without him. Isn't that true? You can look it up. Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. The chance roll of the dice is under his control. Proverbs 16, 33. The dice is cast into the lap. It's every decision is from the Lord. The fluctuations of the human heart are in his hand in both welcome and unwelcome ways. It is his to create, to direct, and to restrain. And the heart that knows him is his gift, as is the new heart, the old prayer says rightly that the hearts of kings are in thy rule and governance, and thou dost dispose and turn of them as seems best to thy godly wisdom. So again, I think Moses, as he reflected upon this truth, he would have said, this is greatly encouraging to me. Because what is Moses' primary problem? Pharaoh. Isn't Pharaoh the primary problem here? Moses is, from a human standpoint, a nobody. 
He's been wandering around in the midnight wilderness for the last 40 years following a handful of sheep. And Pharaoh is the ruler of a great empire. The greatest empire of the ancient world. Pharaoh is the most powerful man on the planet. And Moses has been given this impossible, absurd responsibility to stand before Pharaoh and say, let the people of Israel go. And the word used here, to go serve the Lord, that's the word used earlier of their service to Pharaoh. So in other words, Moses is to say to Pharaoh, there's a new boss in town. The children of Israel are no longer your servants, they're God's servant, let us go. Now Pharaoh's going to scoff at this. So Moses' primary problem, without a doubt, is Pharaoh himself. But Moses need not fear because God ruled over Pharaoh's heart, which is to say that God was bigger than Moses' biggest problem. Now, how do you apply this to your own life? I guess the primary thing I would say is to recognize that the God of the Bible is really big and really glorious. And if Moses can prevail, if God can rule over Pharaoh's heart, don't you believe that God can take care of you? That God can guide in your set of circumstances? That God is big enough for your set of problems? I mean, your problems are trivial compared to Moses' problems. Moses has real problems. Pharaoh is a massive obstacle. But what an encouragement for this man to be told, Pharaoh's heart is in my hands. And I will turn it in any direction that I choose. So if we can trust God for the greater something, surely we can trust God also for the lesser issues of our own lives. Now we will return to this in weeks to come because there's much, much more to say. But before we move on, let me just point out to you the statement here in verse 23. Let my son go that he may serve me. This is the message that Moses is to deliver. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. This is the first time in the Bible that Israel as a people is declared to be the Son of God. This is intimate language. Let my son go that he may serve me. Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 we read, Out of Egypt I called my son. Matthew's gospel picks that up and actually applies that to the Lord Jesus Christ, who in a real sense is the greater Israel. But you see, this kind of language, this is, can cause us to almost take a little nap right now because we are so used to thinking of God as our Father. I mean, we say it every Sunday here, don't we? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We do not recognize that the original audience was stunned by those kinds of statements. To think that this great, all-powerful, all-sovereign God relates to me, and from a New Testament perspective, relates to me through Christ, whereby He is my Father. Oh, this is extraordinary. Is it even possible? And then also, I think we cannot miss the fact that in this text, there is a distinction being made, is there not, between Israel and Egypt. Israel is God's son. Egypt, if they do not repent, will be under the judgment of God. All right, and that brings us to our next section, verses 24, 25, and 26. Now, this is the interesting section. This is bizarre. 
This is the, the person who came to me last Sunday and showed this and said, what are you going to do with this passage? Well, let me read it to you. So Moses starts off. He's on his way to Egypt. He's traveling through the wilderness. He has his wife and his two sons and at least one donkey. Had a lodging place. It's not the Marriott. It might have been a recognized lodging place, a place where there was probably water available. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Wow, that should cause you to stop and ponder, shouldn't it? Then Zipporah, this is Moses' wife, then Zipporah took a flint, it's a flint knife, a knife with a blade of flint. She took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he, presumably God, let him alone. It was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Bizarre passage, don't you think? Kind of came out of nowhere, don't you think? It's interesting, I was reading Josephus, and Josephus covers the same material pretty much. He doesn't have this section. This passes over it. What are we to make of this? It is strange indeed. Well, let me begin by sharing with you that there is considerable disagreement in terms of how these words should even be translated. And I spent time reading about a dozen different English translations this week. Sort of at the end of my study, I thought, well, let's see what all the English translations say. So I was pulling up off my shelves and reading them and thinking, well, this is a lot different than what the ESV has. Let me share four thoughts with you, four observations. First of all, the name Moses. Are you listening to me? The name Moses is not in the Hebrew text in these verses. Even though most of our English translations supply the name at least once, many of them supply it twice. So, for instance, verse 24, the NIV says something like this, At the lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and sought to put Moses to death. The word Moses is not in the Hebrew Bible. So the English translator is supplying the word Moses to make sense of the text. But what the Bible actually says is the Lord met him. The Lord met him. The Lord sought to put him to death. Is that significant? Well, perhaps. A second observation. The word rendered bridegroom can mean relative. So it doesn't necessarily mean bridegroom. That's a possible translation, but the word has a broad enough sense of meaning that it could be translated as relative. Uh, number three, I'm just going to state it because it's not real delicate, but I'm going to state it. The word rendered feet is sometimes in the Bible used as a euphemism for one's genitals. Okay? If you don't understand what I just said, well, that's great. I'm trying to speak over the youngest in our midst. Number four, the immediate context leading up to these verses concerns the death of a firstborn son. That's the context. The death of a firstborn son. God has just said, go to Egypt and announce that if they don't let the people of Israel go, that I will kill the firstborn son. So all of these considerations causes Douglas Stewart, a very competent Old Testament scholar, to suggest the following translation to us. 
I'm just going to read these words to you. At the lodging place on the way, the Lord met him, meaning Gershom, the son of Moses. At the lodging place on the way, the Lord met Gershom and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched it to his genitals and said, Surely you are a relative of blood to me. Perhaps a liturgical kind of statement appropriate for a circumcision. So God let him alone. It was then said, A relative of blood because of the circumcision. Now that's a radically different way of rendering these verses, isn't it? So we're not even sure who the he refers to. Does it refer to Moses or does it refer to the son of Moses? Now I'm sharing all of this with you to highlight the difficulty that these verses present to us. Nevertheless, all of that aside, the basic sense, I think, of what God is trying to communicate in these verses is quite clear. Do you know what it is? What do we read in Genesis chapter 17? In Genesis chapter 17, God came to Abraham and instituted circumcision for the male descendants of Abraham. Now, God did not say on that occasion, I think this might be a good idea. I'm making a basic recommendation. No, you see, it was a command. It was not optional for the descendants of Abraham. And so now God has called Moses, sent Moses on this mission, and we know if we know the rest of the story that Moses is going to become the lawgiver to the people of God. And so what I think everyone agrees upon is that Moses has failed in this instance to keep the law of God himself. He had not circumcised his son. And the consequence of this was so serious that God sought to put someone to death. Either Moses himself, which is how the ESV takes this, and I think probably at the end of the day that would be my preference, but I won't rule out the possibility that it's actually Moses' son that is in jeopardy, but one way or the other, the blame for this does ultimately lie upon Moses because Moses has been negligent. Moses has failed to obey. Now, is this a strange text? Yes, do we all agree on this? But there is an application that is so clear and right on the surface of the text. And the application is this, obedience really does matter. Obedience really is important. And a second truth I think we should take from this text would be that we should view God's assault as finally a work of grace. There's grace in this text. Because God is disciplining Moses. But the Bible tells us that God disciplines those whom he loves. Now, so God doesn't ignore this sin. God intervenes in order to awaken Moses to what he needs to do here. And so if I'm applying this text to my own life, particularly as a father, the primary application I'm going to make is that I have a responsibility in terms of family. I have a responsibility to be obedient to God in this area of my life. And so how am I doing with all of that? Okay? 
And by the way, we're once, we're once again reminded, are we not, that Moses had feet of clay, aren't we? And there's some encouragement in that observation as well. Think about his failures. You remember him? He murdered an Egyptian. He was at least on this occasion negligent as a father of his responsibilities. His wife had to intercede and perform the circumcision because he had been negligent to do this. Was he negligent in other areas of, of that responsibility as well? He really struggled to trust God. We spent a month considering that. So Moses is far from a perfect man, and yet look at what God does in this man's life. And look at how God uses this man. And so the last thing I would want to do today is discourage any of the fathers in our midst. I don't mind gently rebuking you, but I want to really say to you is that it's not the end of the story. Look what God did in Moses' life, and, and God can do something similar in your own life. So obey him, submit to him, in all things. Trust him in everything. And I suppose I'd be remiss not to just draw attention to the role that women played in Moses' life. You've noticed this? How many times women saved this guy over and over again. I mean, his mother at the very beginning of his life, who says this is a handsome son, he's a beautiful boy, I, I can't put him to death. And then Miriam, Moses' sister, who's so smart and so clever. And then God, who turns the heart, works in the heart of Pharaoh's own daughter so that Moses is preserved in the home of his very enemy. But the daughter adopts Moses. And then you've got the midwives. Remember the midwives who, who will not obey Pharaoh's command. And, and they play a role in the preservation of Moses' life and many others as well. And now we have Zipporah. And again, we could get into the details of what she actually says to Moses. I'm not sure she's being actually so harsh to him at this occasion. I think she actually deeply loved him. But God uses her to save probably Moses at this moment. And then finally, let's look at verses 27 through 31 as we conclude today. Moses and Aaron as they go to Egypt. The Lord said to Aaron, God is aware. God knows what Moses need. God is sending Aaron to Moses. Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. Again, as a curious reader, I want to know so much more, don't you? After all these years, what a reunion this must have been. What an extraordinary moment it must have been. Moses just quickly passes over it. He's wanting us to get to Egypt. The Lord told Mo, uh, Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people, and the people believed. They believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and they worshiped. What an encouraging word this must have been to them. Our God knows us, our God notices us, our God is prepared to act. And so we're going to leave the text today and we'll come back to it in January. But I want to just leave with this thought as we leave the narrative this morning. The stage is set for a monumental confrontation, isn't it? So the curtain is closing this morning, but when it reopens in January, the stage is set for Moses to confront Pharaoh. Let my people go. Let's pray. <clears throat>
Father God, as we disconnect this text for a moment to Christmas, we recognize that Moses was a great redeemer. We recognize that he was made great by you. We recognize that Jesus came into the world in order to redeem his people. His name means the Lord is Savior. And so, Lord, I pray that as we now really begin to walk through the Christmas season together, that you will give us many opportunities to think of Jesus and to worship Jesus and to reflect upon the work of Christ as the Redeemer of his people, the one who saves us from our sins. So we just commit this all to you today. We thank you for your word, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand as we sing our closing song? Listen to a podcast that actually David Bashir's put me on to. I don't know if I should thank him or not, but it's called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. You heard of Mars Hill? Mark Driscoll's mega church in the Seattle area. Uh, it's 12, 12 hour long sessions, and I've listened to four or five of them. It's tragic in so many ways. It's so sad. It's in some ways profoundly discouraging of, of a man who has great talent and not enough character, but also a people who would follow him, kind of a celebrity status, which is so prevalent in the evangelical world, isn't it? We follow a superstar. And so it's sad about what it says about Mark Driscoll, but it's also so sad about what it says about the church. But I was listening to the podcast the other day, and, and there was a man they were interviewing. He'd been converted at Mars Hill, 
And he made the comment, he said, I've been in church over the many years, but I'd never really, I'd never really heard the gospel in a way that I could understand it. And, and, and Mark Driscoll presented the gospel in a way that it just clicked for me. And, and I don't know where you're at today, but I hope the gospel clicks for you. That you really do understand what the gospel is. And that you embrace it because in it is life. That we really have fallen short of the glory of God. But Christmas is all about God sending us a redeemer. One who saves us from a villain an adversary, an enemy, far more powerful than Pharaoh. I'm thinking the power of sin in the human heart. And that God forgives us and sets us free from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and ultimately even from the presence of sin someday in heaven. And so I hope that you're trusting in the gospel this morning because the gospel gives life. Father God, I do pray, Lord, that you will help us, each and every one of us, to understand the gospel, to embrace the gospel, to live out of the gospel, to find great joy in the gospel. So help us, Lord. May your Holy Spirit minister to us. You know our hearts. You know our minds. You know our needs. Help us, Lord, to trust Christ, to submit to Christ in all things, and to recognize that Christ is the great treasure, that in submitting to him, we gain the great treasure. These things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's say together the Apostles' Creed as we close. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen and amen.